folks, see you speaking again. Today I'm going to try to clarify an acronym, TTL. Let's start it. Right here in this box, I have a whole bunch of transistors, and I'm gonna pick up one. It's an NPM transistor. Let's do something with it. Let's put it into a diagram first. Here is going to be the input of our circuit. We're going to have a resistor right here, then our transistor, another resistor here, and here we're gonna draw the output. It's a very simple circuit, an elementary one. It's an NPN type. Any kind of NPN you have at hand, Mine is 2N2219. It may be as well BC547. Here is the resistor coming into the base because this is the base of the transistor. Here is the collector, here is the emitter. So this is the resistor into the collector of the transistor. Let's give them some values. 4.7 kilo ohms, one kilo ohm here. That's the whole circuit. In the top, we have the power supply, which is going to be five volts. Here is the ground. That's it. Let's see what this circuit is going to do. So again, two resistors, one transistor, input, output, power supply. We leave this one here. We pick up the transistor. I'm going to connect it right here. I prepared some circuit for you already. And now, here, at the input, I'm connecting a signal coming from the generator, one kilohertz frequency, and we're going to be able to monitor this by using a uh, oscilloscope probe connected to the channel one of the oscilloscope. That's the input you're going to see. So far, so good. Next, we're going to connect the second channel, so the second probe, right here to the output. The output being right here, between the collector of the transistor and the resistor of one kilo, right here. So here, we're going to see the output. And now, let's find out what this circuit is actually doing. I put here a, uh, I generated a uh, square wave on purpose, because it's much easier to see exactly what happens. You see here the signal of the input, when it goes up, it stays up for a while, then it goes back down, and it repeats that all over again. But the output, which is here in the blue on the second channel, not only is a bit bigger, is normal, because the output should be bigger than the input for a transistor, but it's going to be opposite. When the input goes up at maximum, the output goes opposite way, at minimum, and it's always opposite to the input at any time. So now let's find out here something very interesting. A transistor has three terminals, base, collector, and emitter. Depending which of them is touching one of the legs of the power supply, either the negative or the positive, it gives the name of that connection for the transistor. So, for instance, you may have the common, the common base connection. In that situation, the base is connected to the common. That's a configuration usually for transistors in uh, traditional power supplies and high, and high frequencies also. Then there is the common collector. And ours, because the emitter is touching one of the legs of the supply, in our situation, the ground, is the common emitter. This is the one we're using now, common emitter. And then what happens is we've just seen this on the oscilloscope. The input and the output, they don't go 
in the same way. They go with the same pace for sure, because there is no way you can modify the frequency between the input and the output of the amplifier. But the amplitude is different. The amplitude of the input when it goes up, the amplitude of the output goes down. We call this the input and output are out of phase, out of phase, 180 degrees, electrical degrees, of course, because if you represent the electrical degrees on a circle, if here is zero degrees, and if you take that direction, after a full revolution, here will reach 360 degrees, exactly like in a geometrical circle, okay? And if the input is here, the output is right here, opposite to it, okay? When it is opposite to it, how many degrees we have here? 180 degrees. This is why the input and output are out of phase 180 degrees. So far, so good. But then, we just found here what is the function of that circuit, and only for the purpose of the understanding, I oversimplified and I made the diagram only using one transistor. This one in electronics, in logic circuits, this diagram represents the function we call inverter. So this is going to be the first logic function we're going to find out later on. Now, when you pick up this function from a diagram, like here, and you introduce it in a little casing, like a housing or a package, we call it a package. When you put this in a package, we get something called a logic gate. I'm going to insist on that in another video because the word gate may be confusing. Depending where you use it, it may have different meanings. But right now, what we know is we have a mathematical function, a logic function, which is called the inverter. We may have any other logic function we're going to find out later. And when we implement it, this function into an integrated circuit, into a case, into a housing, into a package, you call this a logic gate. So far, so good. So now, how this thing all started? It started many years ago, almost precisely 65 years ago, when in 1959, a brilliant engineer among so many others called Jack Kilby, Jack Kilby, had this idea to put several comp uh, components together and to embed them in a common housing. And this is how the integrated circuit appeared. So now, let's find out. I prepared something for you here. From this tiny transistor, you can see bigger image over here. I've made a cut. That was an identical transistor to the other one. I just cut the top of it because I wanted you to see what was inside, okay? And somewhere in the middle, you're going to find a little black dot from a distance, that's what you see. I have a better picture here. If I try to even magnify to have it on the whole, on my whole screen, take a look. This thing here in the middle, this is the actual piece of silicon representing the transistor. Why the casing is so big with respect of it? Simply because it is able to sustain about uh, six, 700 milliamps, and uh, this amperage is going to heat up, so you can place the little transistor, this is why it has a metallic casing. You can place it, you can place a heat sink over it to keep it functional, because otherwise it's going to overheat and burn out, okay? But the, piece of silicon containing the transistor itself is right here in the middle. That tiny dot is like a square having the side, let's say, a bit less than one millimeter. That's the transistor. 
Okay, so let's take a last look over it. Right here, this is the actual transistor inside the casing. Okay, and now, according to the diagram you've seen before with the two resistors, let's suppose you have this little resistor here, and even this resistor has a casing because uh, we can see some color codes. You can barely see the color code on the resistor, but imagine there are smaller resistors than this one. So what Jack Kilby did, he picked up such components, just a little chip and two very tiny resistors and placed them together in a housing. And that's how the first integrated circuit was born. Now the problem was that little integrated circuit was only a prototype. And actually his technology was never used for practical application of an integrated circuit. Later on, just a couple of months later, there was another guy, by the way, what I, uh, what I forgot to mention to you, he was working for a startup company. I'm talking about beginning of the, uh, uh, this era and he made a discovery somewhere in the summer of 1958. And in January 1959, they handed the papers for a patent and he was working for that startup company called Texas Instrument, TI. Okay? Imagine, even Texas Instruments back in time was a startup company. So this company, Texas Instruments, asked for a patent for the discovery for the integrated circuit. A couple of months later, another brilliant engineer, Robert Noyce, I'm gonna talk about him more in another video. He was the leader of the Traitorous Eight and uh, being part, one of the bosses of the company, Fairchild Semiconductors. This one had another thinking about the integrated circuit. He said, instead of having like here, let's say, resistors, these two are resistors. T is the letter for the transistor, and L is for a logic function, which was our inverter. So let's say that technology, I'm oversimplifying, I'm sorry for that, but just for the purpose of the understanding. If this was the RTL, so resistor, resistor, transistor, and this one, logic, for a logic function. He said, listen, I'm gonna pick up the same circuit if I, oversimplify and I'm drawing this one here instead of the real circuit he've made, okay? So VCC, out, input, ground, same kind of transistor, okay? And what if I simulate these two resistors using also pieces of silicon because the company Fairchild was managing very well the silicon. So I made everything out of silicon. I'm etching these components on the same silicon chip, no wiring between the components. So this is gonna be then, the letter T is like for a transistor mimicking being a semiconductor, the resistors, both of them. The T in the middle remains the same because you still need the transistor doing the amplification and reversing the signal input to output. Remember, they are out of phase 180 degrees. And the last letter remains the same because it's the logic function uh, uh, we need to use uh, for the circuit. So this is our acronym, TTL, okay? Because if you take a look at these two diagrams, they are really identical drawn. So, the diagrams are the same. But the difference between the two is that Jack Kilby picked up distinctive components to put them together in the casing. 
and Robert Noyce was etching all the components from silicon, a monolithical circuit, and his technology we use today. Uh, actually, his specialty was in uh, photolithography, which is a complex uh, discipline involving uh, very good knowledge of photography, uh, circuit design, and uh, chemistry. And uh, he was very well prepared for that. Now, the funny thing is, when the company TI asked for the patent in uh, uh, 59, they didn't have a very detailed uh, uh, documentation because they were afraid that uh, some of the companies may ask for the same thing, so they wanted to be quick. Robert Noyce, because he was much more experienced in these kind of things, he decided to hand very detailed uh, uh, documentation about everything. So guess what? He got a patent much earlier than Jack Kilby. So unfortunately, because both of them were and are still considered the fathers of the integrated circuit, the two companies went in litigation. And uh, the only guys which were very happy for a good couple of years were the lawyers. When these companies, they realized what happens actually, they, uh, they go in justice, practically just wasting their money, they finally reached an agreement. So then they had a kind of cross license and uh, uh, everything went back to normal, okay? Uh, another funny thing is the, the board, the commission who takes care of the Nobel Prizes, they realized extremely late what was the huge importance of the integrated circuits. And uh, they awarded the Nobel Prize for that huge discovery in 2000, almost 40 years later, if you can imagine. And uh, the irony is that the Nobel Prize being awarded only to the people which are alive at that moment is only Jack Kilby who got a prize because Robert Noyce died of a heart attack uh, in 1990, so he couldn't get it. But both of them are still considered the fathers of the integrated circuit. Now, for the purpose of the understanding, if we go here again, I'm going to show you, this is the real diagram used in, in, in the industry for a, a TTL inverter. It involves, if you take a look here, one, two, three, four transistors, two diodes, and a bunch of resistors. All of them, of course, simulated by semiconductor material. So there is no physical resistor inside. Not everything is made out of semiconductors because the diagram has to respect some very strict industrial standards. We're gonna talk about that later, okay? For simplification, I just use a diagram using one transistor because even one transistor can reverse the signal. It just does not respect all the industrial standards required, okay? But basically, this is how you can interpret the word TTL, transistor, transistor logic. The first T for the transistor is actually the replacement of the two of the resistors because everything is etched in the same material, which is a block of silicon, okay? So that being said, uh, we're going to meet each other again next Tuesday when we're gonna talk about more in detail about logic gates. Thank you very much, see you next time, bye-bye.